Hello and welcome to Allen History Nerd. This video is the third part of the mini-series that I'm doing on Stalin and Khrushchev political authority 1941-64, part of a broader playlist I'm doing on Tsarist and Communist Russia 1855-1964, to primarily uh, designed to help A-level history students who are studying the AQA Unit 1H. So now, I have already looked at the first two of the bullet points that you can currently see on screen. Uh, so looking at the war years and then the, the period known as High Stalinism. Uh, and in this video, I'm going to concentrate on uh, on Khrushchev, essentially. So we're going to look at uh, political authority uh, and government, Khrushchev's rise to, to power, policies and ideology, destalinization, uh, political and party change. Uh, and hopefully this will then give you everything you need in terms of dealing with any uh, question looking at political authority uh, from 4164 if you use this video in combination uh, with the other two. To start off, we're going to have a look at Khrushchev. Now, Khrushchev is quite uh, a, a, an interesting character. He had a, a kind of a reputation for being kind of rather rough and ready and and uh, and, and uh, being quite an ordinary man of the people. And sometimes he, he got himself into trouble in the way that he talks about stuff because of this. Now, he was from a poor peasant family in the south of Russia. He became involved in, in Marxist groups when his family moved to an industrial area and he worked in mines and factories as a metal fitter. He joined the Bolsheviks in 1918 during the, the war and worked his way up through the party, eventually becoming head of the party in Moscow in 34. He was an enthusiastic supporter of the purges initially in Moscow and then from 37 when he became head of the Communist Party in Ukraine. Now, these promotions showed that this is someone who Stalin felt he could absolutely uh, trust. He became a member of the Politburo in 39 and was recalled to Moscow in 49 in order to balance uh, the, the influence of Malikov and Beria, and we know Stalin was often uh, really paranoid about anybody who was building any any power power groups, and would need want more of his own men to make sure he could balance that and have absolute control, suggesting to us that very much Khrushchev is one of Stalin's very own men. On Stalin's death, Khrushchev uh, was one of several leading communists, but by no means the best known. These men are going to vie for power. Now, Khrushchev doesn't look initially. Uh, like he is the most likely winner, the most likely person to come on top and take over uh, from Stalin. The period after Stalin's death was one of collective leadership. So what happens with this is we have a group of men who essentially act together. So rather than being a single dictator, we've got a, a collective group. The, the presidium is cut to 10 and five of that presidium are the men who make up the collective leadership. And I'm going to go through and, and look at some of these. Probably the person in, in the driving seat, the person most likely to, to be able to take over from Stalin was, was Malkinov. Now, he assumed, first of all, the two roles of both premier, leader of the government and party secretary, leader of the party. And at that point, he, he looks almost unassailable. This is the guy who's going to take over. But because we're in a period of collective leadership, it was considered to be unwise for one man hold, to hold the two most important offices. So just after one week, Malikov was forced to step down as party secretary, and that role was given to Khrushchev, probably the least known and, and, and the most least, least threat to Malikov. Now, that is not going to prove to be a, a great move, as we can say, and, and maybe Malikov should have learned from the, the history of the Soviet Union and, and what happened in terms of Stalin using that position of party secretary. Our general secretary to, to raise his own standing and to ultimately win the, the, the uh, competition for power in the 1920s. Uh, uh, but he didn't, and he, that was the vision he gave up. The next man is Beria. Now, Beria is a very sinister and pleasant figure. Uh, he continued as Minister of the Interior. He's also head of the secret police. Uh, both of these positions put him in, in a very, very powerful position. For example, he had the secret police bug the offices of the homes and offices of his rivals. He'd rush from Stalin's deathbed to ransack Stalin's office to get hold of, any, of any, all documents that contain details of personal foibles and weaknesses of, it, of his opponents. He was hated by the other leading communists. And essentially, I think there was a feeling as the rest of the collective leadership of, of, of essentially anybody but Beria. So they all had their own personal ambitions. But one thing that would unite the rest of them is, is they didn't want Beria getting hold of power because uh, they feared what he would do with it and, and on, on, for good reason. Now, um, the next figure I look at is Molotov. Now, Molotov had 
had been foreign minister. He'd been very influential under Stalin, very close ally of Stalin. But he, his influence had been waning after the war and, and was regarded essentially as one of the, the old, old guard. But somebody who's probably best, is, it, it, it passed his best. He, it was maybe in a degree of decline in his position. So maybe potentially more of a, a kingmaker than a potential king but someone who, who would play an important role in the political intrigue and standing within the party and who, who, whose backing and support could really help someone. Boroshilov um, was, a, was a, a leading communist of similar uh, vintage to Molotov, not as maybe as well known, but he, he had been a member of the Politburo since 26. He, he'd made, been made defence minister in 34. He lost influence during the war, and it, it, his actions during the war is quite interesting in a way. In, in one way, he was seen as quite a poor general, but in another way, he was seen as being very personally brave. And, and so he remained uh, very popular with the people because of that bravery, and he's kept in the Politburo. Uh, on on Stalin's death, he became chairman of the Presidium, and so you think, well, the Presidium's got the five me members of the collective leadership, and it raises a really key position, but actually probably that position was more ceremonial than anything else. The last of our, 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 our big five then are Khrushchev. At this stage, he is the least well known um, and, and probably the least powerful of the five men, but he has just been handed this role of party secretary. And, and, and this means that he could start building a power base in the party uh, bureaucracy, just as Stalin had done before him. And, and this was going to prove to be absolutely key later on when people try and push Khrushchev out. He's a, he, by that stage, has built a power base that means that he can hold on to that power, at least um, for a period during this, this next section of time. So I already said Beria is probably the most unpopular, most feared of the uh, collective leadership. And he had moved very quickly to try and consolidate his power. And this caused a huge amount of unease and apprehension amongst the other leaders. Now, Beria did introduce some popular reforms, including the release of prisoners from the gulags, which seems a little odd considering quite how keen he was to put people in them, and an easing of Russification in places like the Ukraine and the Baltic states. Now, the others are, are, are really, at this point, trying to work out how they can get rid of him. He is quite clearly the most dangerous of the rivals for, for any of the other uh, wannabe leaders. Uh, and the opportunity came in the form of a, a rising in East Berlin, which, which was blamed on Beria because he was uh, imposing uh, reforms on the East German government. So this gave them the window of opportunity. And they they struck on, on, on June 26th uh, at, at a meeting of the Presidium. Now... Many of them went armed. I think this just shows that the level of distrust and, and fear of Beria. They said they, they went to this meeting. They intended announcing Beria. They went with. They went. They went armed. They also had uh, Marshal Zukov and a group of armed, uh, an armed group from the army in the next door, who were ready to burst in on an agreed signal and arrest Beria. Because obviously, they can't get the police or the the the, the um, secret police to arrest Beria. He controls them. Two weeks later, uh, the charges against Beria uh, were were given, and he was uh, he was blamed for the worst excesses of Stalinism, which definitely um, he he's a, a prime candidate for that. But also bizarrely, he was accused of being a British agent for thirty years. Um, now, the these charges against Beria were endorsed by the Communist Party Central Committee. Uh, which was a group that was controlled by Khrushchev. I remember his important role as, as party secretary. Um, and Beria was then held in custody for six months, given a secret trial and shot. So Beria, probably um, one of what would have been the favourites or the, the front runners to, to, um, to take power, was out of the picture. And interestingly, what this has involved is a step towards the army. And Zukov, who's, who's been... Um, completely sidelined under under Stalin because he he, he was fearful uh, of, of his position in the adulation of Zukov. It has reappeared on the scene. Now the other front runner we we talked uh, we talked about was Malenkov, uh, and Malenkov is the the main the the main guy that most li likely to take control and therefore 
in terms of Khrushchev's uh, rise to power, the, the most important rival. The two of them crashed, clashed over the economy. Um, Malcolm wanted to introduce economic reforms, including halving, halving taxes on peasants uh, to increase the, uh, uh, the increase in the price for agricultural produce uh, and an increase in the size of private plots. So a whole range of things that would be massively popular in the countryside. Um, but in 53, the harvest was poor and Malkinov got the blame. Now, they weren't, the harvest wasn't poor because of his reforms. In fact, his, his reforms may, will, would have done some good, but the harvest fails. This is a perennial issue of, of, of kind of feeding everyone in the Soviet Union and Malkinov gets the blame. He also proposed this new course in economic planning, suggesting greater emphasis on production of consumer goods. Again, not, not a huge amount to see to criticize it in this. And again, this looks like it's going to be really popular. So Markov looks like he, he's got agricultural policy that might well work and is popular. Unfortunately, there's a bad harvest. He, he's he got um, economic planning, again, looks like it might work and, and be popular. But it did cost him um, it, it support in a couple of key areas. So the uh, those who were in charge of heavy industry and the military feared that this was going to mean resources were being diverted away from their sectors. Again, we start to see here the shadow of, of the military and, 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 and the power of the military in the background. So Malkinov, again, policies that make seem to make a great degree of sense, but making some um, potentially very powerful enemies in doing so. So Khrushchev sees this as the, the opportunity to counterattack and, and he, he launches his, his Virgin Land scheme. Um, and in this, he, he was um, aiming to, to end the grain shortage by essentially utilising land that hadn't been used before. And he mobilised the party behind his new policy, remember his, his position of party secretary. And there were some early successes which gave this policy a great deal of momentum. In September 54, um, Khrushchev became known as the first secretary and asserted the, the supremacy of the party uh, party bureaucracy over the Council of Ministers that Malkinov uh, ran. So we've kind of got party versus state here. And Khrushchev pressed home his advantage. He, he skillfully allied with the military leaders. Again, if we can, we see this as, we can trace this back through the removal of Beria and it's now moving into the removal of Malkinov. Uh, and, and also allying with the, the leaders of heavy industry uh, who disliked Malkinov's new course. In addition, Molotov and Voloslov uh, in, in the, the Presidium were able to, to, to get on board with Khrushchev, or was able to get them on board, and they were able to force Malkinov's resignation as Premier in February 55. Um, and uh, Mal Malikov was then replaced uh, with uh, Bulganin, who was a loyal supporter of Khrushchev. And so we see in this Khrushchev a, a, able to use the cards that he was dealt and, and use the um, concerns about other powerful people to push Malkinov, who looked like the most likely person to succeed, out of the way. Khrushchev therefore has, uh, has done really well in the power struggle. He then moved on to, on to one of his major policies and, and one of his, his most important, important steps in this was his secret, uh, secret speech. And, and the policy that, that we're looking at is de-Stalinization. Uh, and from 53 onwards, a silent de-Stalinization had already been happening. Uh, and probably the most obvious sign of this we'd, we'd seen from the unlikely figure of Beria, when he, he, he started remaining, uh, removing prisoners or releasing prisoners from gulags. Um, and therefore, with this huge number of people leaving the gulags, it was impossible to keep silent much longer in the, the horrors of what had been going on. Now, Khrushchev wanted to, to, to push the process of destalinization further, and he wanted to make it more open. Now, there were those um, who opposed this, in particular the real old guard Stalinist loyalists, such as Molotov, uh, uh, Kaganovich, uh, and uh, Voloshilov. Uh, and, and these guys really didn't want, for fairly obvious reasons, all, all the horrors of Stalin's regime to come out. They also didn't want... Um, uh, people talking badly about the boss, the, the, this guy who their careers was based on, and, and, and as they saw it, the successes of the Soviet Union were based on. 
Khrushchev himself potentially has stuff to lose on this because remember when we talked about I talked about him earlier, he he had been involved in the purges in both Moscow and in the Ukraine. But probably those three guys, this old guard, have got the most to lose. And so they, they were opposing him. So Khrushchev here is running into potential uh, problems. In December 55, Khrushchev proposed the creation of a, a commission to investigate Stalin's activity, uh, particularly in the years uh, 35 to, to 40. Um, and this report in concluded that 1.9 million people had been arrested, of which almost 700,000 had been shot. It further stated that uh, of all the alleged plots and conspiracies, they had been fabricated, uh, that Stalin had personally sanctioned torture, uh, which had produced confessions. And finally, the report declared that other members of the Politburo knew all about this. Khrushchev planned to use the report as the basis of a speech to be delivered to at a closed session of the 20th century, sorry, the 20th Party Congress, which had been called for February 1956. So just mind blowing the the the, the so the horror of what had happened to Stalin, which we've been talking about with the, the purges and the terror and the terror and stuff in the 30s. All this is now coming to light. Khrushchev has the evidence in his hands, and he's going to tell the party about it. Now, Khrushchev's speech lasted for four hours, including an interval, uh, and uh, was entitled On the Personality Cult and Its Consequences. Khrushchev and the other Soviet leaders never used the term de-Stalinization themselves. This would have been considered too controversial. But this secret speech, as it's often referred to, denounced Stalin's excesses whilst praising the party. So whilst under Stalin, we'd seen the excesses of, of things that happened blamed on the party, we're now going to have the excesses blamed on Stalin and, and the rest of the party kind of removed from that, that area of blame. So some of the main points of the speech included a denunciation of the cult of personality um, through which Stalin had, had gained adulation and glorification. Uh, it included Lenin's testament in, in which criticism, criticism for Stalin for being too heavy handed and not to be trusted with power were revealed. So breaking that link between Stalin and Lenin, uh, it, it, it showed Stalin's involvement in the murder of Kirov. It, it started to rehabilitate some of, of Stalin's old enemies, Trotsky and Bukharin, and, and, and started to improve their reputations arguing that though they were ideologically opposed to Stalin, they didn't deserve violent deaths for this ideological opposition. It, it highlighted uh, Stalin's responsibility for the great, great purges and, and that these purges were genuinely not un, unjustifiable. It criticised Stalin's war leadership, particularly at the beginning of his war. I remember the war went badly in 41 and there were disasters in there. And it talked of Stalin's paranoid excesses, uh, can, and how they continued after the war with renewed purges uh, and, and the potential of this planning of a further purge of the, uh, the uh, Politburo members to cover up his crimes. And obviously that didn't quite come about because of Stalin's death. So lots of stuff, again, and if you read your history books, a lot of the stuff that's in, in, in there here and a lot of the stuff that I talk about, a lot of the, some of the knowledge of this comes out of this secret speech by Khrushchev. So obviously it doesn't say secret very well. Khrushchev was careful not to criticise all of Stalin's pol policies. He, he didn't criticise anything at all from before 34. Uh, accepted rapid industrialisation and collectivisation had been necessary steps to fulfil uh, Marxist-Leninism and, and to get the USSR ready for war. And Khrushchev was essentially walking a tightrope in all this. So he wanted to denounce the excesses of Stalin's personal dictatorship without discrediting the economic and political system which had been created. Uh, although it was delivered in a closed session, copies of the speech started to be circulated amongst party members. Now, the strength of the reaction against Stalin's memory, memory and against the leading members of the Politburo from the time took Khrushchev by surprise, I don't know how we can take him surprise given the dynamite that's in there, but some of the more radical critics of Stalin were then expelled from the party. Now, further consequences uh, for, for Khrushchev's speech, including, uh, including it contributed to the outbreak of the uprising in Hungary in 56 against Soviet domination, um, and 
Khrushchev was forced to order the Red Army into Hungary and crush the uprising, restore Soviet control. Again, we see that link here now with political authority and military going all the way back, tracing it all, all the way through back to the removal barrier, Maldinkov, and now in terms of, of, of Khrushchev dealing with the uh, outcome of his own speech. Back in, in um, Russia, his speech ending the hostility of the old guard and the, lo the loyalists to Stalin. Uh, and, and he had to tone down uh, his anti-Stalin rhetoric until the 22nd Party Congress in 61 because of this level of opposition. Uh, now, the secret speech can be seen as a, an attempt to boost his political, political authority, uh, with the, lead, the leadership associating Stalin's former lieutenants with the excess of the dictatorship. Um, on this, Khrushchev rather conveniently failed to um, point out his own very active participation in purging the party in Moscow and Ukraine. Alternatively, and this is what some, including Khrushchev himself, claim what was behind all of this, was the need to kind of morally cleanse the, the party, admit the truth of the past area so they could push forward again. And, and the historian uh, Ma Martin McCauley argues that the, there's a far more practical purpose behind this, suggesting Khrushchev wanted to free the party members from fear of terror. And we, we, we talked about how fear of the fear of reprisal, fear of fear of arrest and torture and gulags was one of the reasons why essentially you, you lacked innovation in the party because who's going to put the head above the parapet in those circumstances? So what's been argued here is, is that this should have a modernizing effect. It should revitalize the party because people aren't fearful of speaking out anymore. We see the emergence of the, the anti-party group uh, and, and this group in 57 attempts to, to remove Khrushchev. So it's, Khrushchev is the party. Remember that's his base of, of of his of his power. There are other organisations, including the state, and so those who go against Khrushchev are anti-party group. Um, and what he was able to do was he's kind of go well. If you attack me, you are attacking the party as a whole. Hence that again, that name, anti-party group. Uh, Markov, uh, Molotov, and uh, Kadadovich um, were able to win a, a majority within the presidium. Uh, against Khrushchev whilst he was uh, away on a visit to Finland. However, Khrushchev managed to buy time and say, well, OK, so you, you, you guys have got that vote against me. Fair enough. But what, what it needs, it needs to be voted on by the Central Committee. This can't be just decided by the Presidium. Uh, and that gave him enough time to make sure that the Central Committee uh, was full of his own supporters, which then mean that he could uh, win that vote. Uh, and we also see, again, this connection with the military, with his support, including Marshal Zukov, uh, who is now Deputy Minister for Defence and could rally the support of the Red Army in favour of Khrushchev, as well as Khrushchev being able to rally support within the party. Now, the anti-party group is, is defeated. It, it, the, it's, its members are expelled from the Central Committee and from the Presidium and sent to lesser positions uh, far from Moscow. So again, in here, we can see change because that's not what Stalin would have done, because Stalin would have had them all shot. Uh, but, but Khrushchev doesn't. Um, Sokov is promoted to the Presidium, uh, but this is very short lived. Again, maybe not complete change from, from Stalin. Khrushchev feared the power and support the, the marshal could muster. Uh, and so he was accused of creating his own cult of personality and demoted in October 57. In March 58, uh, Bulganin, uh, Khrushchev's former ally, was accused of encouraging the anti-party group and was forced to step down as premier. And Khrushchev took over as premier, therefore leading the government, as well as continuing as first secretary of the party. Therefore, he now had uh, the two mo most powerful positions in the country. And, and he was therefore able to gain that kind of uh, absolute control. Now, we do see disagreements, as, and as we've just been through, between Khrushchev and the anti-party group, um, and that they, these are over things like the, the secret speech. Uh, there was also ideological aspects to, to the conflict between them on, um, on how diff policies should be carried out. Uh, Khrushchev favoured a programme of democratisation and decentralisation, uh, and we can see, therefore, a, a, an argument for a degree of change from Khrushchev in terms of moving away from the highly centralized and autocratic Stalinist system. 
Um, and th these changes were opposed by the traditional Stalinists in, in the anti-party uh, anti group. So we see change pushed by Khrushchev and, and those who benefited from the old system trying to, to stop it. Uh, and we see democratization in, increasing party membership from just under 7 million in 54 to 11 million in 64. Most of the new members were ordinary workers and peasants, therefore making the party more representative of the people it was supposed to um, represent and lead rather than this kind of privileged elite that had emerged under Stalin. So we have change again. Now, some of these changes can be seen as being really quite positive. We, we see the reviving of the comrade courts, which party members accused of minor offences could be tried by groups of their peers rather than um, subject to the much harsher, harsher techniques of the police. Um, Non-party members were allowed to attend party congress and offer advice as consultants on matters in which they had expertise. Uh, there was a limit to the amount of time party officials could serve, which would prevent party bureaucracy be becoming this self-serving block as it had been under Stalin. So again, positive signs of change. Now, decentralization involved transferring power away from central government uh, uh, to uh, of the, the 15 SSRs uh, and including handing over great control of economic uh, development to the regions. Um, and 60 Moscow ministry, ministries were closed down as a consequence of this. Uh, the 105 regional councils were created to coordinate economic policy at a regional level, uh, and, and this uh, gave a political benefit to Khrushchev in, in he could remove men who had been previously uh, loyal to likes of Malkinov from government ministries in Moscow and create a network of patronage where people owed their jobs to him, to again mirroring some of the techniques that had been used by Stalin. But local Soviets uh, and, so, and these regional councils were given more power to make decisions affecting their area. Um, since the downfall of Beria, there was a reduction in the power of the secret police, uh, and there was uh, the secret police were absorbed into this new committee for state security, um, which you might have heard of. It's called the KGB, uh, and that's brought under direct control of the government. So secret police and terror don't go away completely. Um, the size and, and the size of the force's ability to terrorise ordinary citizens, however, was reduced. It's a slightly terrifying thought about what had gone before when the KGB is a reduction. Um, and we also see a partially independent judiciary system being re-established and, and some steps towards dismantling the highly centralised Stalinist apparatus of state control. So things are easing off, if not not approaching anything what we can we, we consider um, similar to, a wet, to the Western world. The 22nd Party Congress of 61, therefore, it, it, it takes place in, in the backdrop of um, Khrushchev really having consolidated his power. So we see the defeat of the, uh, it follows the defeat of the anti-party group. Um, and, and so Khrushchev is wary of raising the issue of destalination again, as he wanted to consolidate his, his authority of the party um, in that previous era. But now in 61, he felt more confident felt like they, that he could. Um, and so we get even more information now come out about the scale of the purges and Stalin's responsibility of them. The most mind blowing bit of all this, I, I, this is, I, I always think a slightly odd story. And there's this 77 year old woman who'd been imprisoned by both the Tsar and Stalin, who took to the platform and informed Congress that Lenin had appeared to him in a dream and said he did not like lying next to Stalin in the Red Square mausoleum. And as a result of this intervention, Stalin ordered that Stalin's body be moved, a place, uh, places named after him be renamed, that monuments and statues of Stalin be taken down, and a, a memorial to Stalin's victims be built in Moscow. So we, the 22nd Party Congress leads for maybe slightly bizarre reasons to, to really quite radical de-Stalinization. So in conclusion, Khrushchev took the USSR in a different direction from Stalin. He, he, he had his policies of de-Stalinization. De These were a gamble. They were a break from the political system which had created Stalin's personal dictatorship. However, Khrushchev was a product of that very system and there was much continuity in political authority. 
from 53 onwards. Khrushchev still emphasized the ideological and moral leadership of the party, and, and again, we see this of him attacking the anti-party group, and, and the, he started emphasizing the successes, at least particularly the economic and technological successes of socialism in the Soviet Union. The hierarchical structure of decision-making largely remained intact, although there was some decentralization. And most of the changes are, are, are fairly minor. Uh, the party under his guidance and leadership was always uh, in, to be seen as being right on matters of policy and ideology, and people who disagreed with that, again, there still was no room for that. Uh, and the political economic system in the USS still remained slow to change, to, slow to respond to changing circumstances. So although maybe a degree of the fear of uh, the absolute excesses of terror under Stalin had gone, there is still the KGB. There still is the fact that the party is right and, and no other view is, is completely teller, is tolerated. Now, the consequences for speaking against the party might not be as harsh as they had been, but they are still there. Thank you uh, very much for watching. I hope that helps you with your understanding of political authority. Um, uh, watch the other two videos you haven't done all, all, already. Um, please hit like if it's been helpful for you. There's also the thanks button on there now as well. And also, if you haven't done so already, then uh, please, please do subscribe. Loads more on Soviet and, um, and Tsarist history, as well as a, a whole range of other history topics, as well as a, a great deal of content, uh, which is helpful for A-level politics as well. Thank you very much for watching.